create streets, um, there's a lot of remarkable features of create streets, but I think one that I'd start with is that it works both on a very small local scale with neighborhood associations and local councils across the country, but also very much at the national level of policy. So Nicholas is very influential in the national um, policy debate. He was, of course, asked by Roger to be one of his commissioners on the Building Beautiful Commission um, and Natalie to be his co-chair. Um, and just recently, Nicholas has been appointed to uh, lead a new body, which is going to be supporting the rolling out of design codes across um, England, which is a very exciting development we'll talk about later. Um, I think it's very hard to overstate just how great the effect of Create Streets has been. So in just a, a very few years in Britain, we've seen a sort of sea change in the public discourse about uh, urbanism. Um, so ideas about uh, popular design, importance of streets as such, about walkability, um, just the very idea of beauty have become completely mainstream, very important, very swiftly. Um, uh, the Building Beautiful Commission last year was one of the results of this. Uh, I think as a result, we are now probably at the brink of a kind of cultural shift that's unprecedented in post-war Europe. Now, there are a few people and in institutions who've been involved in that. Um, Roger was obviously one of them. Uh, Policy Exchange, the organization that I work with, was, was one of them. But I think it's very clear that you know, it, it wouldn't have happened without Nicholas. This is now really at the center of a very major social shift at the moment. Um, so yeah, for that reason, among many others, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Nicholas this evening. Um, mm -hmm. I've, Fisher has told me to ask everyone, you can put questions in the chat or the Q&A, um, and Fisher will then make a selection of them to be asked, to be asked later in the discussion. So any of it come up. Um, Nicholas, I understand from Fisher, we've got a very large and a very international audience this evening, um, many of uh, whom may not have encountered Create Streets before. I wonder if maybe we could just start, if you could tell us a bit about what is Create Streets, what does it do, and why is it so important? <laughs> Last one. If indeed it is so important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm always challenging. Thank, th thank you, Samuel. I mean, um, and thank you for that very kind, and I suspect slightly overly generous, but definitely overly generous introduction. Thank you. I mean, obviously, the key key thing about Create Streets, and I was really rather shocked that Fisher didn't mention this, is that you're one of our research fellows. So the fact that Fisher didn't link this in his uh, list of your roles, I think is rather hurtful, but, but we'll, I'll take that up with him later. No, so... Um, uh, it is quite hard to say what Create Streets is because I think we are a little bit sui generis. Um, it, it, it grew out of, I, I think it would be fair to say, my sort of growing irritation uh, a bit under a decade ago when I uh, was previously working as a banker and, uh, and Natalie as a senior official. Um, as I, I live in London and as I began to, I'd always had a sort of latent interest in architecture and the built environment, mainly on the grounds that if you're interested in architecture and you're interested in natural history, there's always something to look at. Um, and as I started to see some of the post-war estates, to use the lingo, being re regenerated and getting curious as to what they were being replaced with. And I just for a non-British audience, I should say there was a, a wave, mainly from the 1950s to the 1970s, of clearance of sometimes bombed, but often not, bits of traditional British cities over about 30, 40 years and their replacement with, I think we fair to say you know, modernist design both in terms of the design of the building but perhaps in a way more importantly the design of the public space and the relationship between buildings and um, uh, and public space um, and then I started to look at what they were being replaced with because many of the buildings had been badly built and were reaching the end of their lives it became very clear to me at a sort of intuitive instinctive level well this doesn't seem much better in some cases not better at all what's, what's going on here um, and so I just started getting curious as to why we built what we built and what, what's going on? And my instinctive response was, well, the stuff we built 100 years ago seems to be better than the stuff we're building now. And that sort of, that doesn't sort of fit with my natural sort of whiggish, I apologize, <laughs> whiggish tendencies of the world getting better. I, I use that slightly in inverted commas. Yeah. Um, so I started going off and actually speaking to people who were involved. So I, you know, bunking off work on a Friday afternoon and going to speak to Perry, people who'd done air reaction plans, speak to some architects, speak to some urban designers and planning officials and, and starting to read about it. And the more I spoke to people, essentially it was becoming a hobby, and then latterly an obsession, and the more I spoke to people, the more I read things, the more I thought, hang on, um, there's actually 
quite good evidence buried away in largely obscure journals about what people like and where they're happy. And it is very, very inadequately, sometimes not at all, influencing what we actually build. Come back to why that is perhaps in a subsequent question. But um, so essentially, and, and I think, and I, my, my arrogance was to think, well, I don't think anyone's speaking to treasury officials or ministers or even senior local politicians in, in a language that will make sense to them. Because where there is evidence, it's just being left there in you know, obscure journals. And the, the case for good design, which is a slightly slippery phrase, but let's leave it for now. The case for, for good design is being made to investors or house builders or uh, local or national politicians in language which is almost guaranteed to lose their interest in the first 15 seconds. So Great Suites was sort of narrowly set up to try and fix that. Um, mm -hmm. Now to finally answer your question, Sam, and I apologize, I'm probably going on too long. Um, so at its heart, what we do is primary and secondary research into what people like and where and why. What are the relationships between where we live and our public well-being, our private well-being, how many of our neighbors we know, how physically healthy we are, how happy and proud we are to live where we live. And, and the good news is, and again, we can come back to this, is that there are lots of discoverable relationships. So we're all humans, we all control our own fates, but we are influenced by the physical world around us. Of course we are. Um, so that's sort of at the heart of what we do. Um, to fund, partly to fund that, but partly also to bring it to life, we work um, initially almost entirely with neighborhood and community groups. And if I'm honest, they were the only people who would commission us to start with. But it also, because what we were saying chimed naturally with them and with their sense of being done to and done at by the development process. Increasingly, we are actually working with um, councils and with developers and with larger players, and we're delighted to do that. Um, and yes, I think to your, to your uh, earlier point, Samuel, we're also very interested in, in what in British terms we call the planning system. It's not always called that elsewhere, but I, you might broadly say how the state regulates and influences what is built. So we do comparative analysis of that. We do historic analysis. I think perhaps the key insight we've got to is it isn't that strange that there is some role for the state here. It, certainly in a city, in an urban context, there's been state involvement in what we build really li literally for as long as there've been cities. And that, that isn't surprising. The, the externalities of living in cheek by jowl with, with fellow humans makes it hard for that not to be the case. But then the case is, or the question is, well, what works and what doesn't? And we, we're obviously very interested in that. So I'll probably stop there because that's perhaps probably more than enough information on Create Streets. But uh -huh. uh, happy to dive into to more of that as if, uh, if what we want. But yeah, yeah. policy, design, working with communities and, and underpinning research, I think, goes to the heart of what we are. Maybe you would say something about about this empirical basis that you've uncovered. I mean, this there has, Create Streets has done some primary research itself. But a lot of what you've done, as you say, has been combing through journals that are only read by academics and bringing them to the attention, certainly of policymakers and to some extent wider public. Um, I have, I have here. Nicholas is too delicate to do this himself. But I've got. Can you make it out? Heart on the right street. Ah, oh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Or you should all buy one. We should all buy one. It's yes. got a, basically, it's all the evidence that you need when you're uh, looking at this debate. Nicholas even includes evidence that's unfavorable to his cause out of uh, well, because there is, there is well, I mean, you know, humanity um, is complex, you know, so there isn't, this isn't physics, there, 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 are, there are complex patterns, but there are clear trends in the situations most of the time. Um, so I know Roger, I mean, who indeed had worked in these areas for many years um, from a more sort of I don't know, philosophical, abstract, theoretical um, viewpoint, he was not surprised, but certainly delighted and fascinated by Heart on the Right Street. I've got a, I uncovered an email uh, two days ago where he describes it as a devastating book, which I think he meant devastating to his opponents, not, yeah, uh, I, 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 not I, devastating to him. <laughs> um, I mean, the, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, if you could, I mean, a lot of people, I think, find it, um, um, if not surprising, then nevertheless exciting and reassuring and interesting just how much empirical evidence backs up um, things that people have been vaguely feeling already, or indeed in Roger's case have written very eloquently about already. And so if you, I mean, if you could take us through a few of the most important empirical points, I think that would be very much appreciated. Um, uh, delighted to thank you. Um, what are some of the ones to, to pull out? Um, I think an important distinction, this is one that is very relevant, particularly relevant actually in an American context, is for example, the mix of, of, of uses within, uh, within a town or a city or, or a village. So 
the, the settlement pattern that most countries have built for most of the post-war period, and this is not an insight that Credit Suisse has got to, this is an insight others have got to, uh, is one of uh, what is often called zoning or uh, separate uses. Um, so you, you live over there, you work over there, school's over there. Um, that tends to be correlated with you know, driving more, not nothing necessarily wrong with that, but perhaps more importantly, with walking less and with knowing slightly fewer of your neighbours. And those things tend to be correlated with lower physical health and, and less sense of community. Um, I wonder if it's just worth pulling up, and this is, I'm talking to Fisher now, if I may, just the, there's a slide which we were looking at before we went into this call, just on a traditional block pattern. And it's perhaps worth contrasting, Samuel, if you agree, that with oh, the, uh, yeah. the previous one. Because it's, um, we talk a lot about gentle density, where you get the, brilliant, thank you. Um, let me just pull that up. Um, so what you can see here, and this is actually one of our, this is one of Crate Street's urban, early, early bits of urban design. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see here a tight network of streets, public squares, private gardens. You can see little Mews um, uh, houses up at the top in orange. And in the purple up at the top, you can see um, flats above shops. Now this type of urban design, uh, optimizes outcomes most of the time for most people so you know we all need our own personal space and privacy this gives you lots of houses and it gives you private gardens that are safely private it also gives you public squares that are safely overlooked so this type of block pattern is associated with uh, with lower crime in some robust australian and slightly less robust uk data um, that mix of uses with the shops up at the top of this image is associated with being more likely to walk to your shops more likely perhaps to bump into a friend on the way and you know have a uh, a, a, perhaps not a profound, but at any rate, a transitory and agreeable relationship with a higher proportion of your neighbours, which tends to be good for us. Um, uh, having uh, green space that is a private garden or is a safely overlooked public square is correlated with children playing more outside and with parents feeling less stressed. Um, if we can just go to the next slide, Fisher, and this is, for, forgive me, this is a real, this is a slightly cartoony version of yeah. what you might call certainly the post-war suburban model and this will be familiar possibly to any urban designers watching where you've got you know, houses in one place a fast road and you've then got you know a drive to primary school secondary school supermarket or shopping center this type of form is, is associated with with walking less with knowing fewer of your neighbors uh, and often actually with with, with less sense of, of, of personal pride as well uh, or place pride i should say um, and then, and I probably can come off the sides now, Fisher, thank you. you know, other interesting correlations we can find is that um, uh, streets which have uh, more traffic are associated with um, you know, worse air quality, with worse lung quality and worse children's development. Streets with more street trees in are associated with people walking more uh, and with, with better physical health outcomes. Um, so there's a whole range of relationships. Another interesting one, again, we could go into this in some detail, and this touches on architecture as well as urbanism, is um, how people respond to different types of street. So there've been some fascinating studies, um, actually mainly done in America, showing how people behave differently in front of, if you want what might call sheer facades, un un unarticulated facades, and facades which are more articulated with perhaps some symmetry, complexity, and composure, where literally five or six times as many people will randomly help, in fact, spuriously lost tourists. There's one marvelous piece of research done where researchers pretended to be lost tourists and sort of posed in front of different <laughs> buildings in, in a similar part of the same city. And you literally got, you know, statistically significant different proportions of people spontaneously offering to help them in front of building A versus building B. And we can also see, you know, similar patterns in, in reported um, health and uh, happiness in different parts of towns where between 60 and 70 percent of people's response is a function of where they are and you know, 20 or 30 percent is a function of of who they are there are also interesting things and I'll, I'll stop after this example i promise mm -hmm. um you know corridors in big buildings uh or living in a small flat in very big buildings and that can work in some situations for some people tends to be associated though with less good childhood development with high levels of stress with high levels of mental Ill, uh, uh, illness and with more sense of overcrowding and uh, you just sort of play a mental game with yourselves if you imagine that you live say in a terraced house you can speak to neighbors over the garden wall you can come out and speak to them on the in the street versus living in a small flat uh with, with a corridor off the front door you're likely probably to feel more sense of a cr overcrowding that someone is in your space if perhaps you bump into someone in that corridor immediately outside your front door i mentioned gentle density earlier we think that type of gentle density where you're getting the advantages of personal space but also some of the advantages of propinquity of being close to neighbors, but in a way that's controlled. They're not always in your space. You can be in their space or you can be in your space. You can choose, you can, you can opt back. 
and that that seems to optimize well-being you know for most people most of the time again this isn't true of all people all the time and it, and it changes a bit with climate so what gentle density means you know in marrakesh will be different to stockholm you know with differing requirements for light and oh. uh, for climatic control I'll press pause there because I can go on about this for hours. Uh -huh. so, but I mean, it's endlessly fascinating, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you, I think I'm, you often surprise people a bit because there's this, uh, people have the dichotomy in their minds between, well, there's two options. There's high rise density and there's low rise picturesque suburbia. And we have to choose one or the other, or we blend the two, we have sort of low rise with occasional towers in it. And that, that's one of the things that surprises people, I think, when they come across Create Streets. Your pro density, right? You, yes, I mean, you Create Streets, the clues, the clues in the <laughs> right. you know, I mean, Can't have a street without quite a lot of density. Yeah, um, um, uh, yeah I mean, uh, it's not to say there's no place for, uh, for, for low density, it, it clearly uh, is, but um, we, we, we use the phrase gentle density um, and we're trying to promulgate that because it allows you to create, you know, obviously Britain is a, modestly small island. Um, it allows you to create more homes in a finite amount of space, which has advantages practically. Less space is needed to create housing. That makes it less politically tricky, um, but also allows you to, I think, to lead to some of the advantages of, of place quality. And it is just, it is shocking when you look at the poor quality of much of what has been uh, built over the last few generations. And the great irony is the, the developers, who not unreasonably want to make money, no criticism of that, um, are actually leaving value on the table um, and we can see very clearly and we've done actually no it's, we don't have a slide on it but um, we've done pricing analysis of every single property sale in six British cities uh, from a few years ago and this was some of the primary analysis we did um, and what we learned from that was that what you might call the, um, the the gentle density premium if you like or the heritage density that premium associated with living in a reasonably tight network of concentrated streets with clear block patterns was six or seven times higher even when you adjusted for centrality to um, the new build premium. So people are actually putting a far higher premium on the place than they are on a new build versus an old build. Now, not many, not many estate agents or realtors uh, like uh -huh. that type of data, but nevertheless, it is there. It's slightly stronger in some places than others. So again, there are, there are complexities in all this, but the, uh -huh. the, 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 the slant of the, of the evidence is incredibly strong. People pay more to live in beautiful places where they can have their own control, but also meet neighbours when they wish to. So this raises a you know, fairly pressing question, right, which is, so you've got all these demonstrated empirical advantages in terms of health, happiness, sustainability, also apparently got a commercial advantage in terms of a price premium, and it uses less space on the whole. So this being so, how have we gone so far from that kind of urbanism in most of our practice, not just in this country, but basically in all around the world and in a, in a series of you know, varying, I mean, the kind the ways in which we deviated from this in the 1950s and 60s were a bit different to the ways in which we deviate from this in the 80s and 90s. But in one, way, in one shape or form, we haven't built this kind of urbanism basically since, certainly since the Second World War, maybe not really since the First World War. I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a handful of examples, actually right. particularly in the States, where the new urbanist movement is, is obviously starting to fix this. Um, sure. but, but to come back to your question, um, yeah. I, mean, I think there are four or five sort of primary drivers which tend to be true everywhere. And then I think every country and every decade, if you like, plays their own uh, variation on that uh -huh. theme. But if you like, so the, 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 the symphony of, of, of key movements is, um, is one, you know, I was going to say thanks to, due to is perhaps a better way of putting it, due to technological change, it became much easier to build very big, very ugly buildings very quickly and very cheaply. That's a, you know, we, we can now put up a huge, great shed incredibly cheaply, which you just could not do 150 years ago. You needed to use bricks or stones or wood or whatever it was, which by nature has a more materiality in the texture, which people prefer. Um, two, I guess linked to that um, is, I think particularly post-World War I uh, and due to higher uh, living standards in the West, which is a good thing, just to be clear, uh, you know, as the cost of labor increased, uh, it became far less economic to just do routinely the type of you know, ornament and decoration on a facade that had been you know, typical, particularly in the Victorian period. So, so the cost of manual labour increased. That's arguably a good thing, but you know, that was the consequence. Um, perhaps to be, uh, perhaps the key one, which I should have perhaps already mentioned, is obviously the invention of the motor car. Uh, now, the car is a marvellous thing. We're not anti-car in the slightest. Um, the liberty that the car gives uh, people to move around you know, is a marvellous thing. Um, However, I think we made a, across the world, we made, we confused the liberty of the motor car in a 1930s rural road 
with um, how you should make a town centre or a bit of a settlement work where you don't need to have that you know, reliance on the primary motor car within the town. And then I don't want to get into specifics on a country by country basis, but particularly in the States, but elsewhere as well, you know, we obviously then tried to drive you know, freeways or motorways or fast fuel carriageways right through the heart of towns. Birmingham was probably the town in the UK that got most uh, inflicted by this malaise. Um, so those are three key things. Then there's probably a fourth one, um, which is fashion, actually. So, I mean, there the clearly was a, a modernist reaction against not just historical buildings, but actually historical towns as centres where people came together into settlement. So, mm. you know, Le Corbusier's vision was clearly very different to a vision of a traditional settlement. And again, I think it's important to have some understanding of why. If you look at the state that many European towns were in in the early 20th century, begrimed by over 100 years of coal dust and soot, wow. besmirched by, you know, the consequences of war in both world wars. You, know, you can understand why a generation turned, you know, turned their back on that and wanted to, 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 you know, to, to strive for something better. It was um, really amazingly widespread, right? I mean, even, even the more traditional architects in the interwar period tended to be pretty anti-street. Um, and even the really good, you know, I mean, architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, clearly a genius, but he, he hated cities and he, you know, really had a plan. We're going to get rid of the city. There's... The difference between post-war and interwar, I mean, you're clearly right, is that if you look at the, if you like the good ordinary, the bog standard building that was uh -huh. done interwar, uh, a far, certainly in Britain, which is the country I know best, um, a far higher proportion, I think, was still being built on a street pattern. So if you look at the, um, you know, the, the, the London County Council housing, a lot of the council housing, actually the, the houses that were built into war, whether they were Metro land or perhaps some of the tighter homes for heroes built immediately in the 1920s, they are pretty typically on a street path. Not always, not perhaps perfectly, but no. I, I think the real, the, the, the fundamental change of common practice, as opposed to, if you like, you know, architectural luminaries happened post-war. And interestingly, if you look at some of the, and it wasn't obviously so much, but some of the housing built immediately after World War II in this country, Britain, um, Actually, that, that was done on quite a standard and traditional pattern because that was the only patterns they had. Mm. So if you look at the yeah. immediate post-war council housing in London, actually, it looks like it's from the 1930s, oh, which is because it was. Actually, although, although you know, it was built in the 1950s, they used the plans from 20 years earlier before the war. Oh, it was only really as some of the incentives changed. And there was a, an important piece of 1950s legislation, which essentially, together with, I think, evolving fashion, essentially incentivized local councils to build bigger buildings and literally paid them a premium for doing so right, so yeah. it was sort of in the, it was subsequently changed. But sorry you were probably trying to ask me something else and i've gone off no no that was it. yeah um, uh, you you were on i think you were on number four of the causes sorry yes you did well, I mean, I yeah, it's my fault for interrupting you um <laughs> I, I, mean, I think those are probably you know th those uh, are the things that are probably common a, a, across the world Clearly, then each country plays its its uh, you know its, its theme on that. Right. Uh, I think in America, as I understand it, and I defer to probably some of our uh, audience. I think you know the the the, 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 the I'll say the cult of the motor car, but the cult of the motor car in inappropriate places. I think was probably the most important theme. I think in Britain, it was initially um, a complete reliance on public sector building, not in itself necessarily a bad thing, but it meant that it was particularly subservient to, to fashion and what was deemed to be good design and to understandably utopian visions for a, for a better world you know, uh, without the, uh, the, the grime of the, of the pre-war coal and, 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 and death and disease. Um, a lot of these buildings were, right when they were first built, they had a very brief spell of popularity, right? People um, were quite happy to get buildings with central heating and indoor bathrooms for the yeah, first yes, time. That, that's True. I think it's, a, I mean, I've, I've gone back and looked at some of the records on this. I think it's a bit exaggerated. So oh, yeah, really. um, there was also quite a strong sense of, you know, feeling they were being done to and, and um, you know, uh, uh -huh. forced away from their communities. And there's quite good evidence of actually uh, social dislocation as people lost their communities and got sort of decanted, you know, uh -huh. hook, line and sinker in somewhere else. Now, they started to do that a little bit more sympathetically and trying to move people en masse. And the famous example was in Sheffield, where whole streets were literally put into the sky and the, the, the Skyway was re, re, renamed with the same, the same name as, as the as initial uh -huh. street. But Amazing. pretty uh -huh. quickly, um, uh -huh. and in some cases immediately, there was responses against this. And the contemporary phraseology was, was hard to let. And what that actually meant was that they, they couldn't get people to move in. And a lot of places literally were never full. Now, this is going back to a world which to the modern British audience will seem amazing, where there wasn't the type of pressure on housing that we, that we now have. Or oh, well, it was a different type of pressure. Um, but uh, 
I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's easy to overstate the, the, uh, the uh. immediate popularity. It's, it's worth adding, just to be sort of contemporaneously fair, you know, I think the problem in the last 20, 30 years in this country hasn't been that. No, it's course. been that essentially because we've got a very chaotic planning system in this country, um, we, we have a sort of field by field development pattern where increasingly concentrated small number of builders believe that what they can sell best and certainly what they're used to selling is a sort of uh, small detached house uh, that you drive to. And that's what they know how to deliver and they certainly can sell that. Um, the place value of the things they create is, is indubitably less than that of a, a proper place. Um, they know they can get planning permission to do that. And so that's what they do. Um, and uh, do they, would they be more profitable if they moved to a different business model? It would be surprising to me if all these developers were just were sort of consistently missing a trick over, over, I guess it's a span of decades now. It, right? it would be hard for most of them to move to that business model, given uh -huh. the nature of the permissions they can get for the land they choose to, that they can build in. So uh -huh. um, the, the, the easy answer to that is no, which is why they stick with it. The, uh -huh. the more complex answer is I think if you started to incentivize developers different by what they can get permission for or what they don't need to get permission for, then I think other models start to evolve. And in fact, in fact, they are now starting to evolve, partly I think under pressure uh -huh. of others and some of our work and others is there are now, and I'm not going to start name checking firms. I'm not sure that's the purpose of the Roger Sweeten <laughs> Foundation, but yeah, there are firms and a growing number that in uh -huh. slightly different ways are trying to play more of a long-term stewardship model or are trying to think about how they can, um, you know, create the types of place that we're talking about. So there, there is a range, there are a range of firms starting to do this, uh -huh. but although it's getting better, uh, the, the, what you might call the planning risk is, is greater for those models. And interesting. Uh -huh. we, we, we're currently advising a, a, um, a landowner in the West country. And I have to say what, you know, what they should do, we believe in terms of uh, place value and uh, uh, outcome is not something they can currently get through the planning system in their county because the county is saying no don't do that go and build something over there and you know, don't do something that can, can actually bring the village together and, and give it a heart so you know we are still seeing you know so a rational developer is not going to do that uh -huh, if, you uh -huh. if you can't get you know why would you waste money trying to get the planning picture? all the money you spend before you have what well, in this country we call planning permission is money you lose if you don't get it um, uh -huh. so why, why would you do that you speculate on the motive of the local authority in not giving permission for this? And I think it's complicated. Um, uh -huh. You know, m most people are well intentioned. So, you know, oh, I don't think there's a sort of, you know, I don't think there's a sort of you know, Svengali figure in council sitting there wishing ill intent. Um, oh, one of the key things um, that is problematic in the countryside is, um, and actually in suburban areas as well, is highway standards um, and back to back uh -huh. distances and minimum parking requirements. Uh, so if you're um, expected to put in you know, wide roads that you can not, not you know, uh, reduce speed from 30 miles per hour as you take them, if, you've, if you're expecting two or three parked cars per small house, then it suddenly becomes very, very hard to do something that actually fits into an existing village or small town. Um, um, and there's also a desire to keep new settlements away from old settlements, which is sometimes right and, and sometimes wrong. So you're... Green Street is mostly focused, its primary area is, is urbanism, um, and you're in a certain sense stylistically neutral, um, but the work you've done has tended to, tended to draw more on sort of traditional models of architecture as well as traditional models of urbanism. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about you know, what connection do you see between those two things? So, so very generally, is there such a thing as good urbanism without good architecture? And then more specifically, is there, can, how much, how, what is the relationship exactly between traditional urbanism and traditional architecture? What, uh, is traditional architecture an important part of the mix? Um, certainly, um, beautiful architecture that people like is an essential part of the mix. Uh -huh. I, think, I think I'd say two things. I don't think this is where we would you know, differ from some, from quite a few designers. I mean, I, I have this odd sort of variant of the same conversation multiple times where, you know, and I'm not an architect, and I, I certainly don't pretend to be, um, I find myself in a conversation with an architect saying that I think architecture matters and, and they're saying, no, the space in between matters or the public place matters, but the architecture uh, is uh, just, just, just a stylistic preference. Well, if you think that, be an accountant or, or, or you know, or be a highways uh, engineer, well, why be an architect uh, if you don't think it matters? So, uh, um, 
So, so you know, what we find, you know, I won't start repeating all our research again, but what we find in our research, both I guess empirically, but also our practical experience in, in, in workshops, is that the, the, the nature of the way you enclose a space is a critical part of the human response to that space. Um, and, you know, uh, let's take a perhaps ridiculous example, you know, the, um, Piazza San Marco in, in, in Venice. You know, if it didn't have, you know, Basilica San Marco and uh -huh. the, you know, the library and the other buildings around it, it wouldn't be the same space. Even if it was the same size, and the same uh -huh. height, it would be a different space, you know. So, so, and any attempts to understand the human response to village, town, cities that doesn't take account of that is missing a key trick. And uh -huh. almost without exception, Every single book I've written, or sorry, I've not written, I've read by a planner or an urbanist or an architect almost entirely misses that, with one partial exception. Very interesting. Uh, so the, people do talk about active frontages. That's a sort of bit of a, a, uh -huh. a phrase that's used a lot. Of, and active frontages are a good thing, but uh -huh. um, it doesn't actually get to the heart of the, of the human response. So my point one would be is you, you do, you know, it does matter. The architecture matters. Point two would be, uh, and I may annoy some of your listeners here, um, uh, Samuel, so I, I hope not, but uh -huh. I, I don't think it has to be <laughs> traditional. warning for everyone. Yeah, yeah. So, so if, you, if, you, if you're wanting it, it must be traditional answer. I'm afraid you have to look away now. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's not that it has to be done in a way that used to, always used to be done, but it does. Yeah. The, the most popular architecture with most people does tend to have certain qualities. So uh, it has texture and materiality. It has complexity. So as you get closer to it, there are things to look at for the human soul to respond to, but it also has some shape and composure. So as you step away, it, it resolves itself into comprehensible shapes. Um, we as humans clearly respond better and prefer, there's very good evidence on this, both the buildings and other things, to things that are near symmetrical. We find more symmetrical things typically more attractive. And when we're going down a street, we tend to prefer what we tend to call variety in a pattern. So something that rhymes and repeats, but doesn't necessarily completely you know, repeat you know, ad infinitum. And uh -huh. The opposite, we, we sometimes refer to as spreadsheet architecture, where it's just completely monochrome, boom, 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 exactly the same, no, no, no life in it, no vitality. Uh -huh. um, I defy anyone looking at the, the polling, the pricing, the focus group work to, 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 to argue against that. Though occasionally people try, but there just isn't the evidence there to, to do uh -huh. so. Um, so, you know, and, and I think one thing I should add is that um, place typically trumps time. So we all, again, it's something that comes up time after time in workshops, is that people want stuff that is built near them to feel as if it is of their. Mm. Um, that doesn't necessarily uh -huh. mean it has to look exactly the same as what's there already but it uh -huh. needs to feel that it fits in and is not imposed from elsewhere and you, you see that with groups you know poor rich left right it, it, it's a consistent theme it's it's put differently but it's always there so that that sense of place and that's something actually interesting that architects do increasingly recognize as important and there was a i think a good uh, document from the royalist british architects about a year ago it recognized the important sense of place and it wasn't the uh -huh. first um um that as you know that matters too. So that will often mean it may be same materials or needs to rhyme with, with, with what's there before. So traditional architecture is a very good way of delivering great places. Uh -huh. um, and one of the reasons I guess we end up doing it so often in our work is because if we're community led, that's so often what it is, what people want. Right. So, you know, uh -huh. that's sort of, we, we're naturally led there, but, but we would never insist on it. And um, uh -huh. I mean, there's a lovely development uh, in Cambridge, Marmalade Lane, which I think has many of the qualities of, of traditional architecture, but isn't, I think, you know, I certainly, certainly I don't think the, the developer would want it referred to as traditional. Um, <laughs> and actually, we're working on a project uh, in a town, in a poor town in the northeast of England, which I, although it will be very traditionally urbanistic, partly for cost reasons, partly for others, I think it will end up being a bit more, I wouldn't say modernist, but I think probably plainer and less decorated than a traditional, traditional approach. And I think it will uh -huh. still be a good place. Uh, maybe it can uh -huh. be better another way, but I don't know. Is that, is that a vaguely helpful answer? I, no one, I, think I don't think anyone's left the call in confidence. So I, I hope I haven't shocked too many <laughs> Outrage people. Outrage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, traditional architecture is not the only way of delivering traditional urbanism, but it's certainly a good way. That's yes, the, it's probably the, probably the easiest way in the sense that you sort of you, you can uh -huh. copy. And you know, marvellously self-confident architects like Francis Terry, with whom we've worked quite a few times, uh -huh. um, you know, are happily shameless to say sometimes they just copy what's there already or what's been done elsewhere. And there's no shame in that. Uh -huh. Yes, he's got a book. Um, Proud to be pastiche, I think. is. Uh... <laughs> yes, yes. It's a marvellously. Yeah. Actually, I'll ask you about this. This is a devil's advocate, devil's advocate question. I mean, create streets... So it's, uh, it's you're obviously a great alliance builder and it's got uh, a lot of support from both sides of the political spectrum and from all sorts of groups who wouldn't immediately expect to be on the same side as each other. But you do get 
you know, some attacks or some criticism. There's sort of two themes that you find. One is this, this traditional urbanism is this kind of nostalgic pastiche, um, sort of not serious and so And the other is um, something elitist about this. this is a sort of a, a fantasy about a hierarchical past trying to impose this in the present. I mean, this of course, you know, Prince Charles encountered a huge amount of this, the famously at, at Poundbury, and you get some echoes of it now. And I'm wondering how do you how do you respond to those kinds of to those kinds of claims? Um, I mean, I think we get less than he he did. Um, oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, um, and I think the to to the elitist response, and I, we do get that a bit. Uh, we'd always just say, well, we go with what people prefer. And um, uh -huh. if people didn't prefer that, then we would never advocate it. We, we go, you know, when we do work uh, in a community setting, we go with what the people we're working for want to do. Um, uh -huh. So, and I'm, you know, and the, actually the, one of the moments that helped give me the confidence to give up my previous job and do this was a morning I spent on a housing estate in South London, you know, listening in on a session, you know, with a, a range of people with a very diverse range of, of, of socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, who were saying what I was thinking as well. And I, if I'm honest, I think I probably uh -huh. had had in my own head, this is, these are my preferences, these are my views. And I'm, I'm probably, although it feels instinctively right to me, uh, perhaps people with a different background will think differently. And actually on the whole, they don't. don't know. There, are, there are nuances and complexities. So if you've got a, and this is work that um, uh, David Halpern among and others has done well, you know, if you've got a particular connotation uh, linked to certain types of architecture or place that is maligned for you, in your personal story or maybe the story of your community and things may change and there are obviously are and i'm not going to start lecturing on them um there obviously are complex connotations can i just hang on two seconds there's noise happening can i just sorry just two seconds sorry i just uh, it's not noise was starting to happen i apologize um if you've got complex connotations you know to do with you know racism or sexism or a certain type of architecture i can see how you might end up in a very different okay, right. place uh -huh. So I, I think sometimes, you know, what would be right for most people isn't going to work for all people. And that, that's fine. I think we should just go with that. Um, on the pastiche, I mean, and Rob, Robert Adam would say that you can always tell when something's built. And even if it's built to look like it's 200 years old, you can always tell it's not really. I, I'm not sure I quite agree with that. But um, good design happily steals from the past and happily uses modern materials. And uh, I, I I just don't see why we would close ourselves off from you know, right. magpieing interesting details or very, you know, or proportions from the past. So um, I don't think the population care about that. Purity and an elitist concern that, uh, or at any rate, an elite concern. That's uh... well, it is. It is actually an interesting thing. I mean, we obviously uh -huh. a year ago, as you'll remember, Samuel, um, you know, the, the the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission got a lot of criticism for that word, beauty. But the general public, they, they use the word beauty without a scintilla of self you know, doubt. <laughs> um, as you will recall, you know, a lot of the spontaneous uh, messaging we got from the wider public was very Amazing, yeah. supportive of the fact that we were just using this word again. And it was, I have to say, it was only a professional concern and I th that, that this word was sort of somehow elitist. And oddly, it's not elitist at all. I think it's the opposite. Uh, ask about the commission. So, so you were... Originally, Roger asked you to serve as a commissioner, and then after his, you know, after he ceased to be chair for a time, you were interim chair, and then you were co-chairs again at the end of the year. And Roger was, of course, by that time very ill and, and was very keen to work with you. But uh, that's that's obviously a, you know a slightly complicated professional story, and you were carrying this with very different backgrounds. So it it fairly obviously could have been a tense relationship, sharing the chairmanship of a commission and having to agree one document as your joint statement. Um, that's not, however, having been both of your research assistant, assistant by the end, that wasn't my experience. So I wonder, could you, I think it would be a general in interest in our audience, how was it to share a commission with Roger Scruton? I mean, it was a, it was a great privilege, actually. Um, I, you're right, and it could have been a really difficult and fractious relationship. I think it was sort of set up to be so almost, in <laughs> a convoluted history, which we don't need to go into now. Um, it was an absolute joy to work with him, uh, and indeed with you, Samuel, and I'm sparing your blushes. Um, and um, what was it? I mean, um, he brought the capacity, or perhaps his 
perhaps his you know, capacity to work long hours was reduced. I suspect it was. I hadn't run a commission with him or worked close with him before. But you know, his, his precision of thought and ability to help boil things down, as far as I could judge, was still absolutely there. Um, and you know, he, he recognised that I had an awareness of some of the, I guess, the boring detailed planning regulation, together with the great work, I should say, that was done by the commission and by our advisors, who, who should absolutely be mentioned. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it worked practically. And it was a, it was a very, um, it was an oddly, and I hope it's not an inappropriate word to use, but it was an oddly joyful experience to sit right. those sort of long winter evenings, um, uh, you know, in the farmhouse in Wiltshire, trying to get this right and trying to get that right judgment between the necessary precision of expression and the necessary detail, you know, buried away in the, in the more detailed policy proposals. Um, uh-huh. And uh, I thought, I mean, perhaps naively, he, he seemed to be getting stronger actually during the end of the year. And I, I, I dared to hope that it was all going to be well. And then it was, a, it was an awful and terrible shock when uh, his secretary phoned, I remember very clearly one, it was a Sunday, wasn't it? So it was at the weekend. I was uh-huh. taking my uh, eldest son around HMS Belfast when I got the call and was absolutely collapsed. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a strange, complex and mixed experience working on that commission, although a great privilege and a great success. But, uh, but I hope the word joy, which I deliberately use, I hope that's not shocking uh, even to Lady Scruton or to any other audience. Because I mean, I'm not saying there wasn't sadness in it. There, there clearly uh-huh, was. Uh-huh. But that sense of, because actually, you know, many hundreds of people gave evidence, many members of the public, all the professional bodies, public bodies, um, you know, hundreds of pages to wade through in your call because you have uh-huh. wade, you have oh, yes. wade through them. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the commission, and I, I think I can say this, you know, Certainly to start with, we, we didn't all agree on everything, and nor, nor should you. That's not the point of a commission to sort of all agree on everything. But we were able to find a, a, a very large um, common ground that we could all agree on um, and that we felt was important and clearly has been important and has had an impact so far, touch wood, on, the, on government policy. So I think it, it did feel, it felt purposeful and meaningful. And that's, you know, um, work should feel that. Yes, it was a great, it was one of the things that always surprised one about Roger, was, of course, he was sometimes, you know, very provocative in a good way, but he would, he was, in person, he was very much a peacemaker. Yes, I, I, it was clear, I mean, the, sorry, go, go on, Simon, sorry. Well, I just remember his, his trick he played again and again last year, which people would come filled with some, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, and Roger would do this impression with, Pretend, pretends to be a hopeless old man. You go, oh yes, yes. yes I, <laughs> I've got the gestalt, but but I, could you just put this down into one side of A4, mm. one side of A4, and absolutely it will go straight in the report. Mm. And of course, hardly anyone ever got round to doing the one side of A4, so he was off the hook afterwards. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that's a, that's a, yeah, a very good trick. Um, no, he was. Um, uh, I, mean, I think it'd be fair to say quite a lot or certainly several of the advisors to the commission you know perhaps had been taken in by the the bogeyman that elements of the media had created you know which he palpably wasn't um he was a in person a kind and funny man um i remember i think i've met the story before something i remember the first time i met him which was before the this commission there was a sort of proto be be building better building beautiful commission a few years earlier which came out of a a few conversations which to be honest didn't ever really quite make it um and there were a bunch of sort of industry heavies at this first meeting, frankly, rather pompously going on about why things had to be as they were and any type of change was inconceivable. Uh, and he just beautifully and perfectly punctured the pomposity by saying, of course, he didn't know anything about all this. And all he'd ever built was his garden shed, but he had done it to Vitruvian principles and thus sort of <laughs> swept, uh-huh. you know, sort of <laughs> swept away all the way. I mean, you know, it was, it was a, perhaps a cheap trick. I don't mean that in any way discreditably, but uh, no, he, he was, he was um, very characteristic. Was, uh, yeah, but, uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a very educative man to work with. I think we are now ready to take some questions from the audience, which I've got streaming in from Fisher. Um, here we have um, two part question. Are there examples of some currently practicing architects uh, or companies that you would recommend? And uh, could you offer a US exemplar of successful urbanism? Oh, crikey. Probably nail uh, both of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that depends what you want to do, I'm afraid. I mean, um, wow. so I'll, I'll um, and I'll restrict myself to UK architects where I feel I'm, I'm better able to answer. I mean, I think some of the, the good traditional architects, you know, Francis Terry, Ben Pentreath, Adam Architecture, but there are good, polite, contemporary architects as well, such as Mole Architects um, uh, or um, 
uh, David McHale, who's just won the Goldsmith Prize. So there's a range there. I think that the architect we most like working with for running community events, not quite the same thing, is John Thompson Partners. So there's a, there's a range of answers, but by all means, uh, send me a more precise version of what you're looking for, and I might be able to give you a more precise answer. Um, a US example of successful urbanism, I think, I'm sorry, this is a slightly obvious answer, but I do think um, uh, Seaside does take some beating, the, the first and in many ways still the best of the new urbanist developments, which I think, and I, I didn't have a chance to say this earlier, but Samuel, you, you, were, you were being too kind in your, in your introduction. <laughs> Uh, in the, you know, m much of what we've done is, is learning from the US or learning uh -huh. from things that have already been done, but haven't been done as widely in a UK context. But I think Seaside in Florida is the, is the obvious example. There are a range of others, but that's probably the best to, to study. There's it's got the most writing about it. Um, really interesting question here. Um, Gabriel from South Africa asks, what do you think about applying these principles to townships uh, or, or uh, slums on the edge of cities in developing countries? Um, I, I'd be cautious in my reply, in all honesty. I think it's, it's, you know, it's important to be aware of what one doesn't know about. I mean, all I'd say, I think, is that as I understand it, this is from reading rather than from personal experience, one of the issues in, uh, in slums is unclear land ownership. So often there's one landowner and the reason you get the unregulated development is because the people don't have clear ownership rights and they're not, but nor are the ownership rights being enforced. So um, pr probably that's the key thing is, uh, but interestingly, and again, um, there may well be people who know more about this than me on the call, but um, slums do typically follow immensely organic and, and eternal patterns of streets and private and public space. So probably the best thing to do for slums is, is to regulate the land ownership. I won't get into how, but allow the people who are living there essentially to own their land, you know, through whatever mechanism is appropriate or, or possible, um, and then allow them just to grow organically. Um, and that's actually the pattern of how um, towns developed historically. But often there was a bit of regulation to it. But if you look at the you know the growth of medieval towns in this country, or indeed of 18th or 19th century towns in America, you know, essentially they they grew organically with some sort of code of varying degrees of specific specificity allowing them to happen. I'm not uh -huh. sure that's the helpful answer, but I think it's probably the best I could in all honesty to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, uh, Roger was very keen on these examples of towns in Turkey that were built according to an ancient rite that he claims to go back to the Roman Empire. If you built your home during the course of one night and it was standing by morning, then you got the right to the land if the land was otherwise unused. That sounds like a fairy tale, but, <laughs> but uh, I can't comment but on that. But there are, so I, uh, you did produce remarkable photographs of these very beautiful settlements that develop in the outskirts of Turkish cities, because some, some of these kinds of constraints on uh, the kind of plot that you use and a street-based pattern seem to emerge organically under those property, property laws. I, 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 that's very interesting. I mean, I think there is a really interesting point there. Sorry, I know you're trying to answer audience questions, but... Uh, you know, simple rules about towns and cities uh -huh. um, in terms of the street line or height or materials, just really simple rules. I, I think the evidence is becoming, perhaps it's not uh, overwhelming now, but do seem to allow cities to be more resilient and flexible. So mm -hmm. simple codes allows for the type of flexibility and compl complexity that towns need. If they get overly complicated, then it, then it becomes a huge barrier to entry and only a small number of people can operate. And critically, yes, you can't have people self-building or custom building uh, because it's unclear what they can do. So y y y that sounds right. But, uh... I have here from Edward. Uh, I am a young English architect and the current education system validated by the RIBA is quite simply appalling, completely divorced from the real world. How do you think the education of architecture can be improved, uh, especially as there's so much hostility to any traditional thought? I mean, I think there's... Um... Well, my, my, my cheap answer is, look, and I think it's chapter 10 or 11 of the, the Building Better, Building Beautiful <laughs> Commission report, because we, we wrote several pages on that. So that might be my cheap answer if we look at that. My, my hopefully slightly more helpful answer would be, um, I mean, yeah, the great sadness is that because I'm, I'm afraid I, because so many architects have, have, aren't respectful of what people like, um, you know, the volume house builders don't use them. So I, mean, I think the great tragedy is that volume house builders basically don't use architects. So most houses in this country, in this Britain, are not built with architects. So we need to sort of bring that we need to bring the production of houses and, and architects back together. Um, I think architects and planners have got much better on urbanism in the last 20 years. So I think there is hope. Um, and um, I, I think the, the key thing is to relearn the art of being a service industry and of understanding what it is that people like and where they're happy and where they feel connected with their neighbours. 
and base it on that. So I don't think it's going into battle full tilt on traditional versus modern. Just leave that to resolve itself. But architects, like anyone operating in a mixed economy, should understand what it is the people they work for want and what makes them healthy and happy. And I think once you start asking those questions, then, then you're naturally led to a range of arc answers, which I said, as I say, I think genuinely don't need to necessarily be purely traditional, but I certainly think it's very difficult for them to be passionately antithetical to uh, traditional urbanistic and even indeed traditionally artistic uh, um, architectural responses. Uh -huh. so I mean, hopefully, that's, hopefully that's some helpful, Ed. But I mean, Edward, <laughs> do, do get in touch if, uh, if we can help further. There, there are, you know, there are, there, are be there are beacons of hope, I think. Uh -huh. And as you say, on urbanism, there have been huge strides. I mean, even preceding Create Streets. No, things in, about, large the, parts preceding, yeah, absolutely. The, the discourse is actually, I mean, often I read like Richard Rogers, Norman Foster writing about urbanism. This sounds eerily like Create Streets. Now, not necessarily reflected in the actual practice that takes place. That's striking. Gap that that's the, there, but... yeah, yeah, and I think that, yes, you're absolutely right. So the, the Urban Task Force, which I think was in 2000 or 2001, which was a Lord Rogers report to an early Blair government, uh, and interestingly, I, I came across, it has a lot of good sense in it. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. And interestingly, rather to my astonishment, I came across a reference in a David Watkin uh, book saying exactly that. I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> really? um, David Watkin, for those who don't know, I'm sure many do, was a, was a classical uh, architectural historian who I think, probably fair to say, was not pro Lord Rogers. I think I, I, I spoke to him about it, but I think that's probably fair. Um, uh, so it yes, there was, and, and, but, it, but, it, but it hasn't been influencing what we build. And also, I would add crucially, has not respected the importance of the building as part of making a place. So you see a lot of, I see rather too many, of you know, corporate proposals, town centre regenerations, which bluntly spout much of the language that I would use. And I always say it's, it's not the words, it's the pictures. Um, and if you don't take account of what the wind affects or the effect on human emotions or the sheer glass walls you're putting up and saying it's placemaking, then you're, you're missing a trick, even if you've got a little bit of walkability in the middle. Uh -huh. Um, I have a question from Sheikma in Jerusalem. Um, Amazing international, it's rather embarrassing. It's really yeah. um, so here we have a big problem with, uh, with space which promotes building tall buildings on top of or instead of existing low ones. How do you tackle the problem of infrastructure uh, in this method, I think this method of city building? Um, and how do you find it influences the well-being of the population in terms of the influence of architecture on the people living in it during this change? So I think this is suburban intensification. Uh, I take it one theme here and also introduction of high rise into existing city fabric. Those are two key themes I see here. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a little hard to answer with too much confidence, with obviously out, out knowing the, the, the detailed situation in, in Jerusalem. Um, I think what I'd say is um, you know, too many tall buildings on a traditional street pattern is going to be completely overwhelming. So I mean, it depends what you mean by tall, but as I, I, I've only been to Jerusalem once many years ago, um, if, if you've got historic streets and you're putting up 40 story towers in them, it is going to create a very dark and windy and not very pleasant uh, consequence for those living there. Now, you can probably get over that slightly more easily in Jerusalem than you could in the more northerly latitude. But you know, on the face of it, particularly if you've got uh, arguments over land ownership, I can see to that leading to absolutely disastrous consequences. Um, in terms of um, suburbia, and this is something, something you, you've thought about, I, I would actually make the case in a, in a more suburban context that you, and this comes back to what I was saying earlier about gentle density, you can get many, perhaps not quite all, of the advantages of, of suburbia with a slightly more concentrated uh, density, which may or may not be appropriate for Jerusalem, I, I, I don't know. But if you can imagine if moving from one detached or two semi-detached houses, um, I should say family house, which I think is the American English for it, you know, to three or four terraced houses or row houses, you might say in American English, um, yeah, the gardens will be smaller, the houses will be slightly smaller. But that is, again, how traditionally towns and cities have grown. They've grown right. from being uh -huh. one, two storeys to two, three, four. And if you look at this, you know, look at a street pattern in the city of London or in downtown American city, if you look at it over a couple of hundred years, typically it'll be going from two storey shacks up to whatever it is now. So I think it's not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, clearly you know, there's, a, there's a limit beyond which it can't go. I'm not sure that was the answer that Sheikma wanted, but it's, it's probably the best I can do. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, look at the medieval city of London, quite a lot of the area within the walls was in fact now sort of 
uh, as it were, garden suburb. It was sort of cottages, bungalows and so forth, interspersed with gardens, interspersed with some fields and this kind of, and then gradually that land was turned by its owners into steadily, in, well, first into, I don't know if they had semi-detached houses, but gradually into terrace streets and then floors were added to it, but, but up to certain limits. Um, they weren't this added indefinitely is. until the 1950s when they were suddenly um, started shooting up. But it, interestingly, as you, as you talk about the city of London, I mean, it's just worth making a historical point. Uh, and again, just to lance the, the, one of the boils about this, because you know, the, the, I think one of the errors that's made in a British context is to assume that all planning started post-war. And that's just, I mean, but they've, both the right and the left make that mistake. Uh -huh. they, they regard it either as a good or a bad thing depending uh -huh. on where they're sitting. <laughs> but I mean, that's, as, as, as you know, Samuel, that is absolute nonsense. Uh -huh. So to take the city of, of London, you know, for several hundred years, 150 years, the, the, the burghers and the, uh, and the guilds of the city of London made concentrated and on the whole successful uh, attempts to prevent building near to the city of London because they didn't want competition from other shops. Oh, um, opinion, yeah. uh, yeah, and, and for a while in, in late Elizabethan and early Jacobean uh, England, they were successful. And it was only after the Great Fire of London that they you know, ceased managing to influence the national statute on that. Um, so, you know, all, all cities, in, well, not perhaps all, but the vast majority of cities and towns are affected by um, you know, what, what role the state or local government chooses to have on development patterns, you know, for better or for worse. I think Roger liked the example of medieval Venice where they had uh, a very narrow range of ornaments that you were allowed to use on your window surrounds. And they I didn't, I didn't got down that. to the level of what kind of what kind of foliage patterns you can have around the windows. I didn't know Controlled by the state. Yes. Well, and uh, yeah, the, same, the same is true of a whole range of Italian uh, Renaissance Absolutely. cities where there were, there were quite clear rules on setback and height and materials. Fire was often one of the big things and indeed still is quite rightly. Um, uh, in terms of limiting material choice. And, it was, and, and the, the trick with good regulation is just to keep it simple, I think. Um, I have a question here from Robert Adam, who is going to be the next guest on this uh, series. Sort of an oh, far, more, far more erudite than me. You'll be doing better with him. I'll have to ask him a nasty question. <laughs> Robert, <laughs> Robert Adam is, uh, I mean, uh, the, if, if Nicholas is standing on the shoulders of giants, then Robert Adam is obviously one of those giants who's made it absolutely. possible for us to have this kind of conversation today. Um, so uh, Robert asks, uh, how do you change the architectural profession to care about the views of the public beyond professional approval? I think I think I should say there are architects who do care about that and they don't really work <laughs> right. for Robert. So I, I, I sort of I would and I, I would caveat my answer. Say, I, 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 I think there are those who do. Um, and some of them in, some of them are modernists. Um, point one. Uh, but point two because they're not working for the volume house builders in any in any large number uh, because they tend to be working either for public sector clients or for private sector clients who need to get planning permission i can perhaps most confidently speak in the uk in the short term the only way is to realize that the ways to get buildings built is to build things that people like so i think the planning system in this country and i suspect in others needs to change to preference that that seems to be that so that's the short term answer uh, it seems a long term answer a much much harder thing to do um, I, I, no, I think it's a medium term answer, which is as well as the planning system, which is that the, the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators of public sector entities and those that procure um, need to reference what people like, where they're happy, where you know, all the data that what we were talking about before. So I think if the planning system and the way the public sector, which is an important procurer of, of things, you know, measures success, if we can change that, um, that I think is the, is the short to medium term win, the medium to long term win, and as I say, it doesn't necessarily need to lead to a purely traditional outcome, uh, is it must be education. So if, uh, you know, not just talking about it, but caring about it, understanding it, understanding how you run a workshop to do that, and perhaps critically how you crowdsource preferences, that might be online, it might be in, in other ways, should be part of an architectural profession, it seems to me. And it is very, very telling. I mean, you mentioned some of the criticisms we've received. You know, we, we run, and I think to some degree have in the UK pioneered what we call visual preference surveys, where we control images so that we can do fair comparisons between option A or option B or option C. And we've done that both for research purposes, but increasingly we're, we're doing it you know, live. We're doing it in, for real places and, and real clients. Um, you know, that seems to me should be a key and basic part of an architect or a planner's or a local council's toolkit. And the fact that not, not only that very, very, very few other firms, if any, really do them to any degree, uh, I think it's telling. 
perhaps more telling is the fact that lots of people have been very critical of our using them and saying that's a superficial way to understand a place. I mean, it's clearly not the only way to understand the place and clearly things like traffic and others do matter, I'd never say otherwise, but it is a necessary part. It is part of the process of understanding. And uh, ultimately, I think that's what architects need to be helped to, helped to understand. I hope that's a, I think Robert will give a more fiery answer probably uh -huh. next week. <laughs> next, next time round. Uh, we're just about out of time, uh, but I have one final question here from uh, uh, Björn, which is, where do you think urban planning will take us in the next 20 years? Well, the nice thing about the answer is that you can only 10, 20 years if I get it wrong. Um, well, I think the thing, I mean, the things that I are changing and have changed even in the last few years that I've been doing this um, uh, is that there's a growing desire, I think, for urban regreening that we bring trees and greenery back into our streets and public spaces. Um, in the UK, and I think elsewhere, awareness of air quality is a theme that has grown in the last few years and I think will continue to grow. And as we understand the malign impacts of poor air quality, above all on children's health, but indeed on everyone's health, I think that's, a, that's an issue that will grow. Um, and I think the, uh, we're at a very exciting moment, thanks to actually this type of thing, thanks to digital technology. We've now got tools, and so do others. I mentioned this a moment ago. I think the ability to understand quickly and easily and above all cheaply what people like and where they prefer and how they want to move around the town and the city will just grow and grow and grow almost exponentially. So I am uh, perhaps naively actually pretty confident that some of those forces uh, will, together with perhaps the, 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 the broader discussion about sustainability and energy usage, um, I think will lead to a better 20 years, certainly in the West, uh, than the last 20 or 30 years. I know less about and I'm perhaps less confident about what will happen in emerging economies where the natural and understandable desire for more space and more personal liberty, perhaps compared to the past, I think may lead to them, and this is currently happening, repeating many of the mistakes that, that we have been making over the last 70 or 80 years. So I'd be a little bit less um, confident there. Nicholas, uh, there's I mean, a huge number of other questions and I encourage everyone to, to pour emails on poor Nicholas. No, I went on, so I'm too busy. <laughs> I'll do I'll my best. Questions that way. But we're going to have to draw to a close this evening. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating um, and thank you very much indeed. Thank I you. think I'll just hand over to Fisher. Yeah, thank well, you, thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you, Samuel. Really uh, a wonderful conversation and I'll speak on behalf of our audience who can't really speak at the moment saying yes, <laughs> thank you <laughs> this is the part where we'd all applaud but uh, right. it's what it is right here we are uh, but as samuel mentioned we will be doing our next installment uh, next month in october probably uh, towards the end of the month and i'll be including the details in our follow-up email when we send out the recording of, with this uh, of this conversation but it will, will be with the great uh, british architect robert adam who I'm, I'm really pleased and excited to hear from as well uh, if you enjoyed today's conversation and, and would uh, like to follow along, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter as well as consider making a financial contribution to the foundation. Uh, all support is greatly appreciated and it helps make these sorts of conversations happen. And hopefully eventually at some point in the very, very near future, uh, happen in person too, but we'll see exactly uh -huh. when, when we're allowed to do that. Uh, but as for that, that is all today. I thank you all for joining us and hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Nicholas, and thank you, Samuel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fisher. Thank you, Samuel.